G'day, I'm Will Anderson and welcome to Gruen. We'll get to the panel in a moment, but first, why are so many products available for a limited time only? Vegemite has released 45,000 jars of premium Blend 17, <laughs> which tastes basically the same, but costs twice as much. It puts a rose in every cheek and a hole in every pocket. <laughs> There's also a new limited edition Coke with coffee. You know, so you can be extra alert for your heart attack. <laughs> Tim Tams have a never-ending supply of limited edition flavours, all part of its worse than the original collection. <laughs> but those special Tim Tams contain fewer Tim Tams. Oh, great angle. They taste terrible, but at least there aren't as many. <laughs> Golden Gay Time is selling tins of its biscuity crumbs. Oh, it's going to save me so much time decrumbing my Golden Gay Times. <laughs> and it's not just food. Chemist Warehouse recently sold out of Hamish and Andy's limited edition fragrance, Andy by Hamish. <laughs> Much more successful than my limited edition fragrance, Russell by Todd. Mmm, <laughs> smells expensive. <laughs> but who could possibly fall for all this transparent stunt marketing? Well, here's the Today Show team trying Vegemite Blend 17. We're happy little Blend 17s, as happy <laughs> as can be. Here's the Today Show team eating limited edition Tim Tams. How good are Tim Tams? <laughs> Here's the Today Show team sampling gay time crumbs. Crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, biscuity. Here's the Today Show team drinking Coke with coffee. I have to say, I don't mind it. <laughs> And yes, here's the Today Show team spruiking Andy by Hamish. Andy by Hamish, a smart casual fragrance for the modern man. It is a stunning. Yeah, no, I can smell it. Mmm. <laughs> no wonder Lisa Wilkinson wanted to be on breakfast television for a limited time only. <laughs> Time to welcome our panel from PwC, Russell Howcroft, and from the edge of the earth and this desk, Todd Sampson. <laughs> Joining them are from Leo Burnett, Karen Ferry, and from BMF, Christina Aventi. <laughs> Last week, the resignation of Channel 9's Today Show host, Lisa Wilkinson, made news. The shock departure of one of the network's biggest stars, Lisa Wilkinson, who we're pleased to say is joining us here at Network 10. Ah, oh, spoken with the confidence of someone who assumes Channel 10 will still exist by the time Lisa gets there. <laughs> <laughs> the story thrusts equal pay into the spotlight. Channel 9 management said they'd been unable to meet the expectations of Lisa Wilkinson and her manager on a contract renewal. The 57-year-old host had reportedly asked for the same pay as Carl Stefanovic, who was rumoured to be on around $2 million a year, while she was paid a little over half that. Her final act of today was to put the national spotlight on the gender pay gap, a measure of inequality that shamefully has barely moved in 30 years. Of course, it would have been cheaper to get Tanya Plibersek to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Equal pay made radio waves too. I found out last year yep. that you get paid 40% more than I do for doing this show. I think you get to a point where you know when you're ready to walk. And I think Lisa was obviously at that point as well. Oh, for me, that point would be working with Carl Sanderlands. <laughs> Brands, of course, will appropriate any issue if they think it can sell something. And during this year's US Super Bowl, Audi drove straight into equal pay. What do I tell? My daughter. Do I tell her that her grandpa's worth more than her grandma? 
that her dad is worth more than her mom? Do I tell her that despite her education, her drive, her skills, her intelligence, she will automatically be valued as less than every man she ever meets? Or maybe, I'll be able to tell her something different. Oh, of course, she gets a billy cart, he drives an Audi. <laughs> Classic gender pay gap. <laughs> Audi makes luxury cars. Incidentally, one of their brand ambassadors is Lisa Wilkinson. <laughs> Karen, what does having a fancy car have to do with equal pay? So for Audi, their target audience are cultured white collar workers who are either um, concerned about the equal pay problem themselves or have the power to change it within a corporation. And what that ad is quite cleverly done is it talks to two different fronts. So the first one is the VO, which talks to, I guess, men, and especially we've seen around the Me Too hashtag conversation, a lot of men who talk about women's issues through the lens of having a daughter. Um, but then what's actually really interesting is if you turn off the VO, um, and watch the ad in itself, it's all from the point of view of the girl. And it's all shot in a really nostalgic way, probably about the 70s, all the styling, which is interesting because it's talking about the, the kind of girl that would grow up and now would be in the prime of her career. Um, and she's looking at that and she's relating to it and seeing her own story in it. And the twist at the end of it for this woman is that she sees it's now set in the, um, the current day. So it's not a story about her and her relationship with her father. It's a story about her husband and the daughter and the legacy that she can provide them. So it works in two fronts for two different target audiences in one ad, in one occasion, which is the Super Bowl, that all families watch. Yeah, yeah. and um, car brands, of course, are all about reflecting the values. So as a driver, you're in fact, that, that car is an ad for your values. Uh, and uh, the audience that you've just, just, just discussed, that's the value that they, want to, that they want to advertise about themselves. So if you're in LA and you're a greenie, you've got to drive a Prius. So they're trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I'm for equal pay, I'm going to drive an Audi. It's reflecting their values. This virtue signalling has become really popular in advertising, which is basically just vanity dressed up as selflessness. So what you do is you say you hate something that's very populist and everybody would agree with, but what you're actually saying is, look how good I am. And it's much easier for you to say it that way. My issue with this ad is, I can tell you what you should tell your daughter. You should tell your daughter that your father's a complete idiot. <laughs> because if he thinks the option is to tell his daughter that she's worthless, then that's a really bad option. Yeah, and also your father's a complete idiot because he left your billy cart at the track. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It can't fit in the Audi, love, sorry. Probably should have got a truck and a trailer. <laughs> There's actually something that I've got to agree to you that with this virtue selling, there's an issue with it. What I have a problem with with this ad is it positions equal pay as progressive. You know, flexible working, four day weeks for men and women is progressive. This is just writing a historical wrong. It's a correction. And for me, therefore, because it, it, it shouldn't be positioned as progressive, it should just be positioned as the way it should be, it comes across as a bit opportunistic. Uh, did you notice the disclaimer, do not attempt? <laughs> that may have had a larger significance because Audi has an all-male board and face backlash <laughs> for making that ad. Todd, do companies have to get their ducks in a row before they make a statement like this? They should, but most don't. Uh, and most are juggling the two sides of it. So, no, the ducks are not lined up. In fact, some of the ducks are not even there. Yeah, but you know what, if you, if you spend... If you, if you spend all your time just trying to make absolutely everything perfect, you'll never get anywhere. And the use of brands selling off issues, um, yes, it's gone on forever, but what it absolutely does, of course, is it promotes the issue. I get what you're saying around the, you know, the framing of progressive, but it is progress in order to get equal pay. That is demonstrating progress. But do you think that equal pay, you can't separate equal pay from a broader quality issue, and that applies to representation as well. And it just feels like if you're going to address it, wouldn't you fix up your board? Yeah. If I was the CEO of Audi, I would have tried to sort of line up my ducks a little yeah, bit more, uh, absolutely. Uh, yes, OK, but that is obviously far easier said than done. OK, so 50% of the board, you no longer have a job because we want to run this ad. Yeah, why not? Right. No, but... But, <laughs> you know, but what they can say... Yeah. What they... What they... 
what they definitely can do is be very public about a 50-50 a a objective and show that they're progressing and run the ad. I mean, only 6% of CEOs in Australia of the top 200 companies in Australia are women. So if you waited for that to be completely corrected, you'd be waiting a hell of a long time. You, you, you are right about, you know, the progress is slow. Apparently, if we keep going on the same rate, you know, the progress in Australia, it's going to take 170 years before we've got equal pay at yeah. the same rate, OK? Yeah. So it's slow. But again, this is why the brands using this as an issue will accelerate that. It's not going to be 170 years, yeah? It'll come around a whole lot quicker than that, yeah? Uh, here's another brand having a spray. <clears throat> Mr. Kendall, um... I need to ask you a favor. Not really, not really a favor. Just like, s Mr. Kendall, I worked on the Padstow team actually, and we won the business. I mean, just helped. Okay, okay, Lucy. <clears throat> Casual. Bob, Bobby, how's it going? You're looking great. That tie is super sick. You know, Todd makes more than I do, and he's only worked here for two years. You know, I'm also a really great leader. <sighs> really have things... Do it. Secret, stress tested for women. Lucy got that race, and the person filming the employees in the bathroom got fired. <laughs> Christina, what did you think of that ad? Oh, look, I actually bloody love that ad. I don't know what the audience thought, but for me, what I love about that is that it doesn't have that Disney saccharine ending where you sort of find out whether she got the job or not. This is about the ask not the get, and we know that with women, you know, they don't tend, like, that some women don't approach negotiation in a way that's absolutely 100% confident. It's a hard thing to do. There's a social cost involved, and they normalise just that self-editing that goes on in terms of even the negotiation. I love that. I love that part of it. Also, I feel like I am Lucy. I feel like they tapped my brain for, for all that stuff that she talks about. I relate to that sort of Lou as locker room psych up. I relate to the social awkwardness. And I think there's a bit of Lucy in all of us. It is just so relatable. And the last point there is that job interviews are often used by deodorant brands as that ultimate emotional stress test. And they've just done it in a really fresh, zeitgeisty kind of timely way. So I think they've done, personally, I think they've done a great job. I love it. I think the, the, the asking is, is true. The, I just, I don't love the execution because to me it feels like perpetuating a kind of negative stereotype uh, that she, that it's sort of blaming women's insecurity for wage inequality when the fact is, is it's not women's insecurity that's the cause of the wage inequality. The cause of the wage inequality is that it's run by men and they have to make a decision to do that. And uh, the comparison for me is Lisa Wilkinson in this ad, because Lisa Wilkinson is the opposite of this ad. She is not the poster child for pay equality. She is the poster child for salary negotiation. She leveraged the media and she controlled the message to make it about something which it wasn't, equality, which was very smart, very well controlled. She leveraged Carl's salary to set a top baseline, and in parallel, she negotiated with two networks. That is a role model for salary negotiation. And on that note, I'd like to announce I'm currently negotiating with nine and seven. <laughs> and I am leaving the ABC unless I get pay parity with B1 and B2. <laughs> Banana human parity. Yeah. Or I'm out. <laughs> So, well, the, the um, other thing is that that ad will work. That'll sell an enormous amount of product because it's, it's true to deodorant because, in the end, deodorant's about confidence mm. um, and that brand is a fantastic expression of confidence. So, yeah, it's going to work as well. Uh, one Danish shoe brand dug its heels in deeper. Our haircuts are more expensive. Our underwear is ridiculously more expensive. It's simply more expensive to be a woman than to be a man. Should we seriously get paid less than someone who applies body lotion to his face? He doesn't need a new outfit for every new occasion. He doesn't even know that the shoes make the outfit. Oh, the joy of choosing the right shoe. Fashion is expressing yourself. 
and what every stylish woman is expressing is that equal pay is not enough. Equal pay is not enough. And literally shoehorned its product into that message. Karen, is it a step too far? I think it might be a step in the wrong direction. And what that direction is, I can't really tell. Like, I think <laughs> from watching the ad, it's saying that the gender pay argument isn't about people being paid equally because they're doing the same job. It's saying women should get paid equally because we like to buy things. Um, and, and then they sort of, like, encapsulate at the end with the picture of a stiletto, which is, like, sort of renowned for being this thing that's like a kind of gender constraint as to how women push themselves further just to look more attractive or play a role. I agree. I reckon it's got a stiletto in each camp, so to speak, because it's like the stiletto <laughs> breaking through the glass ceiling. It's trying to tackle sexism with stereotypes and cliches from 20 years ago. I'm like, what the hell? It makes me want to kick the shins of the creator of it with a set of Doc Martens. Seriously. <laughs> it's <just> like, <laughs> Maybe this, uh... Because I think this ad works on blokes, and mm. uh, and I think that it's actually a very there's something very clever about this, because perhaps what women should be doing is lobbying for more pay. It's not about equal pay. It's we we deserve to be paid more, and if the logic is because it's more expensive for us to look like this, blokes buy that. We'll completely buy that. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is smart. <laughs> To summarise Russell's argument, men are stupid, fool us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like, I, I can't tell if it's, it's, if it's clever reverse psychology or just pure stupidity. Because on the, they're basically saying the issue is they're criticising how expensive women's clothing is by selling people women's clothing. <laughs> <laughs> expensive women's clothing. I mean, it's real. I don't know. Like, fashion is just advertising in fancy clothes, you know. And the and the idea is to make it sort of an irrational choice because there is making you want something that you don't need. I think this just confuses all of that. But in some ways, it's typical of fashion advertising. It makes no fucking sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, as we all know, though, if you want to, if that's the position that you want, you take an extreme position because you know you'll be negotiated back. So it's, I think it's clever for that reason. Uh, we look for an Australian ad on this issue, but the only recent campaign is an ANZ one we've discussed before. Here's a recap. If I was Prime Minister, I'd make it illegal. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. When I am older, I'm going to make a change. If I don't forget. <laughs> we played that a year ago. I've checked back in. That kid has done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Must have forgotten. <laughs> this recent New Zealand ad was aimed at legislators. It's me. Until women get paid the same, I'm going back to smoking in the doll queue, <laughs> driving without a seatbelt and burning tyres in the backyard. <laughs> Christina, if you want to change behaviour, is it best to target governments? 
Oh, I think that it's it's best to target a few different people. Behaviour change is sort of built on the back of a series of nudges and what you've got to have is a bottom-up approach, so encouraging women to negotiate, and a top-down approach, so where you're, you're sort of priming government and big business to create the right conditions for negotiation as well. But what I find odd about that spot is that sort of femme empowerment equates to some sort of weird 80s dance flash mob. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, There's something like, hey, Mr Unequal Pay Man, I'm going to take you on with this 80s high kick, which I find... <laughs> I'm like, what, what the hell is that about? <laughs> what I, I read the lyrics to the Donna Summer track, and it's actually... It's, um, it's about the working class. It's about a loo attendant who falls asleep on the job because she's working two jobs, and she's celebrating the working class, and I thought, oh, my God, that is so classist of me to talk about the dance moves in there, but even the working class deserves better dance moves than that. <laughs> so, you know... I mean, if, you, if you're doing these things, if you want to get progress in society and you're doing these things in a coordinated way, if you can get your advertising, which, have, which is obviously mainstream, running at the same time that there's a question in Parliament, then that's when you really, you know, that's when you really know that you're doing a really good job. You've got the whole thing coordinated from getting it on the nightly news via that question and also running the advertising, getting the press ad running the following morning, which gets the radio people talking about it. It's about a coordinated attack. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to raise awareness, use advertising. But if you want to change behaviour, legislate. And if you can do both, that's ideal. But a good example is speeding. So we can run lots of ads with, you know, pinky, if you speed, it's your manhood and all that stuff. But if you legislate putting speed cameras on every corner, they will slow down. Their behaviour will change. Uh, in Belgium, this R-rated ad pointed out one of the few industries where women earn more. I worked as a waitress. As a nurse, I actually made more than the doctors. Within a year, these jobs not only brought me respect, but also a lot of money. I'm proud of this. It's something I chose to do. Who I am? I'm Sasha Gray. <sighs> now that we've played that ad on the show, I can justify all those searches as research. <laughs> And in this stunt from Switzerland, ATMs spat out 20% less cash to men so they could know what it feels like to be undervalued. Aww. Yeah, that guy was mad because he was just there to launder money. <laughs> Todd, is shock a good strategy? Uh, normally I would say it has limited use, but I think that the, the pay equity, the gender bias, is an unconscious bias. Uh, both for men and women, and it's, 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 it's learned behaviour and learned from home, you know? So I think that sometimes it is a good idea to shock people into realising that you do have a bias. We all have the bias in some way, shape or form, you do have the bias. I, I, I do think shocking people into awareness that this is still an issue is, is not a bad idea. I think people like these sort of ads that sort of shock and surprise because when you watch it, you have a massive emotional reaction. It's quite addictive. They're like little mini blockbusters. And people get really emotionally excited about it. Like you look at Coney 2012, people got really jigged up. They all spent like 20 bucks on bracelets. It yeah. did nothing. Yeah. But people were like really excited about it, so... I actually found Coney and no one even gave a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Equal pay it may be in the news now, but it goes back much further to this 1973 ad from the US government. A ticking bomb means trouble for Batman and Robin. Holy breaking and entering, it's Batgirl. Quick, Batgirl, untie us before it's too late. It's already too late. I've worked for you a long time and I'm paid less than Robin. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. No time for jokes, Batgirl. It's no joke. It's the federal equal pay law. Holy act of Congress! If you're not getting equal pay, contact the Wage and Hour Division, U.S. Department of Labor. <laughs> I mean, great ad, but Batgirl hasn't been in the Batman movies for years. <laughs> I reckon she got fired for asking for a race. <laughs> and now, uh, the pitch where we ask our agencies to close the deal on impossible briefs. The news. It's informative, addictive, enraging and a torrential downpour of unending despair. So tonight we've asked our agencies to convince us that no news is good news. Can they persuade us to tune out for good? Please welcome from Carbon Creative, Rebecca Blinko, and from Rare, Brett Wheeler. Welcome. Yeah. 
Rebecca, how did you break the story? Well, we think news today is so overwhelming. It's simply bad for you. Oh, let's have a look. In breaking news, US President Donald Trump has been caught boasting in a recently unearthed interview that he could have, quote, nailed Princess Diana. <laughs> All right, Brett, what was your scoop? Uh, well, we thought we'd create a social experiment to see the effects that news has on people. Let's have a look. OK, so just tell us the first thing you think of. Rainbow. Expensive postal vote. Um, colours. Tweet. Donald Trump ranting on. Bird. North Pole. Climate change. Santa Claus. Rocket. North Korea carrying out nuclear tests. Astronaut. Ice. Epidemic. Penguins. Cold. Race. Conflict. Racing car. <laughs> I like this, Russell. Two yeah. distinct angles. Which did you prefer? Well, I thought that the notion of stuffing an animal was a really creative thought, but in the end, number two, um, I thought that was a really powerful piece of advertising. Karen? I like the creative twist at the beginning of number one, so I'm going to go with number one. Uh, what about you, Christina? Uh, I think I want to be unadulterated. Number two, thanks. Uh, last but not least, Todd? I liked the first one, but I loved the second one. All right, congratulations. There you go. We have a winner. And then congratulations to you both. Which Australian music phenomenon has 30 platinum and gold releases, multiple ARIA number ones, a Grammy nomination, and global sales of 16 million? It's not ACDC, it's not the Wiggles, it's Hillsong. Religion is declining, but Hillsong is not. The Pentecostal megachurch started in Australia in 1983 and is now in over 20 countries with nearly 100,000 worshippers attending every week. Here's a trailer for a global conference held in Sydney this year. What if you started to dream? Like you really believe that God has gone before you? How would church look? We can win our city. We can change the world. We can touch this nation. The great challenge for us is not to just keep depending on what's proven and what's tried and what's established. We have to keep believing God to stretch us and to keep stepping into the untried, the unproven, the unknown. May nations be impacted eternally because, Father, we heard from you here. Wow, a whole concert for Jesus and he doesn't even show up. <laughs> what a diva. And not sure what's with all the horses. I thought they were a sign of the apocalypse. <laughs> That looks like a U2 gig without the edge. <laughs> Hillsong have replaced hymn books with stadium rock. Christina, what does music do for a brand? You know, music has always been part of religion's opium for the masses. I mean, if you gave Jesus an electric guitar and amp, I'm pretty sure he'd be using it these days and he'd probably get a Birkenstock sponsorship as well. But what I guess traditional sort of institutions haven't done is they haven't evolved to sort of modern marketing's toolkit, which these guys have done so well. Um, if you've got a catchy hook, obviously you can hide messages in it, you know, you're all of a sudden as Christian karaoke and the word of the Lord is literally within you. The other thing is that um, there, there is science around the fact that when you sing in um, a crowd, you actually, it, it's like crack. 
you re it releases dopamine and serotonin, so you have this happy high. And if you combine that with a Bose sound system and these, you know, God-given high production values, it's like, hallelujah. <laughs> it's amazing. So they've done a great job there. Yeah, yeah music is, is incredibly important. I mean, it fuels youth culture. On average, teens listen to three and a half hours of music a day. So music is an incredibly powerful link. And it's probably the biggest weapon of attraction that that church has. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think the, the music and that piece of advertising makes them appear bigger than they actually are. And I, I think that's part of the genius of what's going on. Um, so 100,000 attendees every week, worldwide, every week, like, that's actually not that many. You know, that's the same as the NRL on a Saturday, Sunday. They're smart in that they, instead of having a church in every single suburb, they cluster them. So you have these big sort of stadium theatres that they do it in. And then it's all live music as well. So I think it's that thing of, it's one of the only places, for say example, in Sydney, where you can actually see live music. All the pub rock <laughs> venues have closed down. <laughs> so in terms of being like a talented artist... That is artist, a sad day. <laughs> right. We've got to like, go to Hillsong. The pubs are closed as well. <laughs> But it's a really good point, right? So it's not lots of it's not lots of churches in every suburb, and therefore very few people. It's but when you've got like space. yeah, and when you've yeah. got like seven churches maybe in Australia, I don't know the numbers, but it's yeah. like there's only two in Sydney. It's like they're going to be huge crowds. It's going to be an enthralling experience. And music is amazing because it's one of those things that's written not to be it's to be felt rather than to be emotionally processed. So you're not paying attention to the lyrics; you're just feeling it. I think that's brilliant because, you know, and also you're more willing to fork out in the collection plate for music, aren't you, in an environment like that. At least 10% of your wage, I hear, um, when it comes to hills. And it, I mean, it really just goes back to an old advertising truth that if you have nothing to say, sing it. Yeah. <laughs> except, except I suspect they think they've got something to say. <laughs> Hillsong has a distinctly useful edge. This promo for an upcoming conference has long hair, funky hats and plenty of young faces. <sighs> I'm wacky. <laughs> and here's a clip for one of Hillsong's recent chart toppers. Your love was never far You made a way to get to me You were the whisper Leading me to your heart Forever I belong to you <laughs> Oh my God, not quite right, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> I mean, it looks like an ad for General Pants. <laughs> Todd, would Hillsong hide its older members away? So this is what they've done quite cleverly, is a repositioning of religion and church. So they've seen the re research, I've seen this research, that basically says, quote, religion has become old people going to old institutions talking about old stuff. So what they've done is they've repackaged themselves as contemporary, young, music, and they're carefully, carefully branding their message. And it's a repositioning of the church. Yeah, and also the, the message, the messaging of Hillsong, of course, is all around the self. It's all about the individual and the, and the progress of the individual. And we're living in a very, very narcissistic age. Uh, and so you have a whole, you know, a whole group of younger people who really do enjoy themselves. You know, they're taking hundreds of photos of themselves every single day. And now they can go to a weekend, you know, ceremony where that is encouraged, the notion of self-progress. Um, so it's on trend. You know, for millennial and for the millennial generation that they're trying to attract, it's really about that thing of, like, you need to share pics online. If the pics aren't there, it didn't happen. So for them, it's like you'd rather hang out with this cool, young-looking, like, cast that look they're from Riverdale as opposed to the extras from Midsummer Murders. And I agree. I think that what it also does is not only, like, when you target young, what you're doing is as crude as it is, there's this thing called lifetime value. So you're maximising the number of years that they spend with you. What this also cleverly does is almost create this unofficial Christian Tinder where you've got <laughs> Adam Hillsongers who meet Eve Hillsongers the and the congregation populates. So it's a future. Yeah. A tried and, tried and true method, right? <laughs> tried and true. Then Unofficial what? Christian Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> what a great idea for... I'm going to start that. That's what I... I'm going to call it Wilsong. <laughs> <laughs> They've also gone even younger, right? So they have, they have five sub-brands aimed at children starting at age one. 
So they have cubby house for one, they've got their next level up, they've got a fully tiered structure to get you in for lifetime value right from an early age all the way through. They also realise as a church that the values people have are about, you know, if it's about the self, it's about your vanity. It's like other churches traditionally have that thing where it's like vanity is a sin. It's like, it's okay mm. to care about how you look. It's okay to have piercings and tattoos. They realise that it's about people, especially millennials, have their own values and they're not expected to drop those all when they come to the church. They can come into them and they add into them. So that's why they have a cafe in one of their churches. They can sell like coffee beans that are specific to that grind. Like it's so sort of detailed in the nuances that they know that people appreciate. And all they're asking is that you just add Christianity in as another value. I think that's so true insofar that they play, play a lifestyle brand, mm. all right? They're playing other categories. They're, they're playing fashion, they're playing lifestyle, they're playing music as opposed to anything that was connected to Christianity before. Mm. So it's really clever marketing, portfolio management, all those things that we talk about. It's very clever. They are slightly playing cult as well. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what's going to be a cult, Will Song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely a cult. So culty. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of big celebrities have been linked to the Hillsong Church. Chris Pratt, Selena Gomez and a Kardashian. Not the good one. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> but the most vocal Hill singer is Justin Bieber. Here he is backstage at the Sydney Hillsong Conference with his pastor, Carl Lentz. Yes. I, I want to get better. That's why I we just want to love people more. I just want to love Carl more. You're doing a good job with that. He has so much face, it looks like he's been snorting it. <laughs> Karen, is Justin Bieber good for the brand of Hillsong? I think Biebs is great for the brand. Um, <laughs> so he's like a pot-smoking, tattoo-covered <laughs> womanizer, and he's kind of becomes really relatable and fallible, which lines really well with the Hillsong uh, message, which is that you're always just about becoming a better person, always trying to be a better person. So no matter how many times you screw up, Jesus saves again and again and again. Your song is a true Australian success story in that the church founders are actually from New Zealand and we claimed them when they got famous. <laughs> <laughs> Hillsong Music might be our most successful export since Shopkins and the Hemsworths. <laughs> it seems to look exactly the same all over the globe. Hillsong Kiev, Hillsong Sao Paulo or Hillsong Moscow. Russell, is it important to not look too Aussie when you're establishing an international brand? Yeah, well, I think what is important is looking international. Uh, I, I sort of relate this to Cirque du Soleil. So if you think about the notion of a circus, you know, go back 30 years ago, would you go to a circus? Well, increasingly less and less and less people were. Along came Cirque du Soleil and completely repackaged what a circus was all about and created a global brand off the back of it. We don't attribute Canada really to Cirque du Soleil. It's just a international brand. And that, that's, again, the genius of Hillsong. They're trying to do a Cirque du Soleil for Christianity. I think Australia works for some categories like beer, surfing, those kind of things. But when it comes to religion, we've just got no Jesus cred, basically. <laughs> and, you know, Australia, like we worship sport. Australia to religion is like what Taiwan is to electronics, a cheap imitation. <laughs> and so. The other point that I would make is that it's so fortuitous for the Hillsong guys who are from Borkham Hills, like go Western Sydney, um, <laughs> that their names were Brian and Bubby Houston, mm. I think, which sounds like mid-belt American. Like imagine if it was like Brett or Daryl, like that would be <laughs> But I do think as a brand, what you leave out is really important. And they have left out in their global brand that they're Australian. They've also left out Christian. I mean, when they changed their name to Hillsong, they cleverly removed that. And they're not without their branding troubles and issues. You know, Brian's father is a is a, a admitted and convicted pedophile, and it was originally called the Christian Hills Church, and then they changed, they actually had to change the name because of the PR issues they were having to Hillsong and omit it Christian, which also gives them broader appeal uh, on a global stage. Uh, most religions sell the same invisible product, but Hillsong co-founder... <laughs> <laughs> but Hillsong co-founder Brian Houston had this to say about the church's success. Some people think I'm a marketing guru, but of course I've never studied marketing. Hillsong makes over $100 million a year. Russell, is this proof anyone can be a marketer? Well. 
I, I, he says he isn't a marketer, but what he, what he does know that ultimately marketing is uh, a very simple thing. It's about fame. Yeah, so if you are able to attribute fame to your brand, to your product, to your service, to what you do on a Sunday afternoon, that's marketing, and clearly these guys have got a marketing act together. Yeah. And also, marketing is about understanding human behaviour and desires, and who better to understand human behaviour than a church minister? I mean, <laughs> well, it's true. It's because that's what they sort of... They have to be able to understand what people want. Every, every Sunday they do a sermon that talks about insights and they deliver a solution. It's like they're one of the best marketers in the world. Like, Christianity took a pagan festival and then stuck their message into it and they made it into a global brand. If anything, they're the world's first marketer. Yeah. I, I also think it's not just marketing. Like, this is logistics, sales, it's e-com, it's app build, it's the whole box and dice. And the further kicker to it is they don't pay tax and that's something the late Kerry Pracker would have loved. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 religion is uber marketing. You've got a spokesperson that everybody loves. You've got shops in terms of churches. You've got symbols and you've got music and selling faith is big business. I mean, the Vatican Bank has $8 billion in assets. The Vatican Bank. I'm going to get them to fund Wilsong. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think I'm being a bit cynical about Hillsong being a big business, then you probably haven't seen this 1990s ad starring its founder. New from Pastor Brian Houston, money. There's not one person in this building who doesn't need more money. And if you say, well, I don't need more money, then I would say you have a very poor outlook on life. You'll learn why you need more money. Because money is a tool that can accomplish phenomenal things. I need more money, and I'm a tool who can accomplish phenomenal things. <laughs> <laughs> Will Song! Will Song! <laughs> That's just about all for tonight. Please thank our panel, Russell, Karen, Christina and Todd. We'll leave you with another ad you couldn't make in 2017, our segment that thinks of grainy old ads as the cave drawings of our times. If it was 1982 and you had to explain the new concept of random breath tests to a sceptical and unfamiliar public, how would you go about it? Much like Hillsong, through song. This New South Wales government campaign is notable for the bold creative decision to rhyme test with a rest. <laughs> But it's also quite possibly the first and last time you'll hear the police say please, sorry and thank you in the course of one ad. We'll see you next week. Please accept our apology for the inconvenience we are going to have. You. But there's just no alternative <laughs> if we're gonna let thousands more live. So, on their behalf, we're saying thank you. How will you go when you sit for the test? How will you go when you sit for the test? How will you go when you sit for the test? Will you be under all